Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Um, I, I'm Marcus Bolt from England, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to this Zimu's presentation. Now, the idea for doing this show occurred to me while watching Elfrida Schragen's Zimu's a while back. She said at one point that because she trained as an academic painter, when she added an image to one of her paintings by copying a photograph, she felt as if she were cheating. This reminded me that while I was at art college studying graphics back in the 60s, we were considered by some students of the painting school to be second rate, simply because we used mechanical devices such as cameras, epidioscopes, rulers and set squares. I could never accept this and I remember hours of argument with fellow students, my claiming that whether designing a page layout for a magazine or painting a still life, one was bringing to bear the same artistic sensibilities, visual acuity and colour and compositional criteria to achieve balance and harmony and a satisfying competition. Then, back in 2012, I read David Hockney's Secret Knowledge, Rediscovering the Techniques of the Old Masters. Now, what an eye-opener that was in every respect, because basically he proved that the old masters fell into two categories, but also occasionally overlapped. The first group he called eyeballers, those who drew and painted solely from life or imagination, such as Michelangelo and Rubens shown here, and those who employed optics, mirrors, lenses, camera obscura and camera lucida that were painters like Caravaggio, Vermeer, Velasquez, Leonardo da Vinci in later life, Angra and so on. Now, one tell of an early optical painting is that most subjects are left-handed, as Caravaggio's Bacchus on the left there in 1596 shows. But by Vermeer's day, around 1650, artists had worked out how to get round this problem and managed to reverse the mirror image. <clears throat> Now, after suggesting the concept of the masters using optics to friends, Hockney found that some were encouraging, but as he writes in the introduction, others though are horrified at my suggestion. Their main complaint was that if an artist used optical aids, they would be cheating. That somehow I was attacking the very idea of innate artistic genius. Now, let me say here that optics do not make marks. Only the artist's hand can do that, and it requires great skill. And, and optics don't make drawing any easier either. Far from it. I know, I've used them. On the left, uh, you can see drawings by Angra. Note the head of the woman seems to be too large for the body. This would be due to realigning the camera lucida, perhaps after a lunch break. Uh, top right, you can see Hockney using a camera lucida. It took Hockney a year to perfect the technique, and you can see one of his drawings bottom right. Now, here's a slide showing how the camera lucida works. Um, the artist looks down at the drawing surface, that's the paper or whatever, through a glass pane or a half silvered mirror tilted at 45 degrees. But this imposes a direct view of the drawing surface beneath and a view of a scene horizontally in front of the artist, not on the paper, but hovering in front of the eye. And the image on the right, I hope demonstrates this. The, it's not projected onto the paper, it just hovers in, in, in optically in front of your eye, and then you can outline the drawing accordingly. Uh, 
And here's how the camera obscura works. If you can see number one, that's a small hole in the wall of a, or a, a blind or whatever, of a darkened room. Now, the, the Hockney image comes in through that hole and is upside down, reflected onto a, a concave mirror, which is in turn then projected back onto the canvas or board or paper. And the artist can draw an outline shape. And then once he's got all the essential marks fixed, he can go and finish the, the drawing or the painting from life. Now, Hockney continues in his introduction, but to an artist 300 to 600 years ago, optical projections would have demonstrated a new and vivid way of looking at and representing the material world. Optics would have given artists a new tool with which to make images that were more immediate and more powerful. And I hope that Caravaggio demonstrates it. And um, follow, yeah, followed by the Vermeer. Now, to suggest that artists use optical devices as I am doing here, says Hockney, is not to diminish their achievements. For me, it makes them all the more astounding. Next slide, please. Van Eyck's famous Arnolfini marriage has been created using a camera obscura. He no doubt took individual images of Mr. and Mrs. Arnolfini, then transferred them to the panel. Similarly with the chandelier. The optical giveaway is that in terms of perspective, the chandelier should be at a steeper angle, being higher than, than, that, than the Arnolfini's. But it is placed on virtually the same plane as the Arnolfini's heads. Despite all that, it is the work of a true master draftsman. Uh, apologies for that little blue light in the center of the image. I couldn't find the detail on Google, so I had to use a snap from the, the glossy Hockney book. That's a double page spread, that's why it's a bit bent. Now, what reading Hockney's book did for me, me and my painting was to free me up from the tyranny of having to be a draftsman, as I could use all and everything from the squaring up techniques used by the old masters. I hope you can see the squaring up clearly on that slide. Um, they used preparatory drawings, also called cartoons, which are squared up as shown then information can be transferred square detail by square detail to equivalent larger squares on the canvas. It's a surprisingly accurate way of enlarging even the tiniest sketches. And there's an example, um, one of the few I could find that I kept of um, a drawing squared up and then transferred to the canvas and then completed. Uh, one of my paintings. <laughs> hmm. Another thing I was free to do was to take photos of, on my Canon digital camera of still life setups and then open them in Photoshop, modifying and adjusting the composition and lighting as I proceeded. Further modification, modifications could then be made on the actual canvas. Um, now note, that masters such as Vermeer and Caravaggio also adjusted lighting, model and furniture positions as they search for the right composition using optics such as lenses and mirrors, only transferring an outline drawing to the board or canvas when totally satisfied with the reflected image. Now, in this painting by Cagnacci, it's called The Death of Cleopatra, he uses the same model for all the figures. They're moved around the chair and posed in front of the mirror, then outlined on the canvas when the compositionally correct position was achieved. He probably had a sketch to work to, but would continually adjust as he went. 
Now, it's not easy painting a smile. The model would have to hold the pose for quite a while. But by projecting onto the canvas, Van Honhorst, for example, could very quickly pinpoint the important markers very accurately. And then after, probably work from life. Um, to show how photographic the image is, I've added a photo of the actor Simon Pegg. They do seem very alike to me. Perhaps they are, are both showbiz photogenic types of their, their times. Also shown is the now famous Woman with a Pearl Earring by Vermeer, one of the masters of the optics technique. Such an alive painting. The dark background is also a clue to the use of optics because of the depth of field phenomenon, only overcome by later sophisticated cameras with far better lenses than they had in those days. Now, after the epiphany of reading Hockney's book in 2012, I started using the techniques of photographing a subject, adjusting the photo in Photoshop, squaring up and transferring to the canvas, because I was attempting a form of photorealism at the time. Uh, there's um, one called Peach and one called Oranges. They were, as I said, working for photos, and there's a, a boots, my old boots, and some peaches in a bowl. Then, back in 2014, I signed up with a company that asked for 11 paintings, size 100 centimeters by 70 centimeters. Uh, these would be hired out to offices to display in reception and boardrooms, etc., for about two months. They were also for sale. I've had about 24 exhibitions to date, but have only sold one picture, which is this one. <laughs> These were all photograph setups, tweaked and adjusted in Photoshop, as I've said before, then squared up and modified further on the canvas. That is both the drawing and while actually doing the painting. Um, all of these paintings are in acrylics on stretched canvas, by the way. Now, although using the same techniques, I'm now beginning to simplify, to abstract more and more. Uh, that's called Sundowner. And the next one is called Coffee Break. And the next is called Pineapple and Fruit. Next, I'll show you how I went beyond this form of photorealism, finding it eventually unchallenging and a tad too easy. So brought in imagery that didn't rely on modeling, using flat shapes and average color values from life as the following pictures show. Now, in a way, I was trying to emulate what visualizers in advertising agencies do. And I have actually worked as a visualizer. This, we do this when preparing scamps. These are almost symbolic outline drawings to represent a proposed photograph or illustration. These are then shown to clients for consideration and approval before the expensive steps of uh, having the photographs done or the illustrations made, are taken. And there, here's a typical example top left with another of my paintings on the right. And at that point, I was still trying to lose the, the modeling, but I've done that now. Finally, I'll show you some more recent paintings showing how I have developed since the Hockney breakthrough. Now they are, for me, solely about shapes, color, and composition. But still with one foot in the real world, using recognizable outlines of real objects. This last painting I have finished is called Lockdown. It demonstrates my searching for exact compositional positioning of the elements, hence the title with a double meaning. For me, there is the sense that if one mark or shape were moved, the composition would somehow collapse. 
Now, to finish off, I'd like to read a short artist statement, which I wrote for an online gallery I'm represented by. It's, and I hope it's a summation of this presentation. Over the past few years, still life painting has fascinated me more and more. Studying the Dutch, Italian and French masters of the genre and allying their techniques to my own more graphic approach has enabled me to put aesthetic rather than illustrative concerns as the primary motivator. Thus, each painting is a design using everyday objects as a starting point. There is also a personal philosophy at work because to me, it is a wonder that things exist at all, from a perfectly formed onion, peach or pear, through to a plastic bowl or ceramic vase. And it's a miracle of creation that they can be perceived by the mind through reflected light, shadow and color via the eyes. But the profoundest mystery of all is the fact that we have consciousness and could be aware of being aware and that it is possible to communicate this to others through the arts. Over the years, I have become less interested in surface appearances and more intrigued by the fundamental spiritual reality underlying existence, a unity bound together by an ineffable creative power. And I strive for balanced composition in the hope that this will reflect that I also hope that the viewer will see and feel in these works touches of the personal Zen-like moments of wonder at existence I felt, plus the sense of still calm and joie de vivre I experience while painting them. So that's it folks. Um, I'll put my painting website details on the chat to everybody in case anyone would like to have a look at the work since 2013. And um, I do hope you've enjoyed the presentation. And if you have any comments or questions, especially about Hockney's, the Hockney book, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. That's wonderful, Marcus. Thank you so much, really. Pleasure, a pleasure. Thank you. So we now have time for feedback and questions from our people who are here with you. Uh, does anybody want to start? Uh, Rohanna, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Well, there's so much I can say, but I'll try to edit it a bit so that everyone else has a chance to talk. I just loved your presentation, Marcus, and it's only in the last year that I discovered Hockney myself. For, mm. I don't know how I, how I missed that, but... <laughs> I've, been doing, I've been doing landscapes myself, and I also have a graphic background. I, I trained in painting and printmaking. And so I have that love of pure shape, color pattern. And mm. then my involvement with Indonesian batiks also brought in the love of pattern and color. Yeah. And, and so I, I, re I can really relate to what you're doing, even though what we're doing is very different. Mm. I love your statement at the end, and I would like to have a printed copy if that's possible. Your, mm. your last few words, that was so well expressed. Oh, wow, that's kind. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I love your titles. Mm. So many of the paintings these days have these highfalutin intellectual titles that are references to things <laughs> other than the painting. And I've walked into galleries and I've read all the big words on the wall and I've looked at the installation or the painting and I've shaken my head and said, what on <laughs> earth is going on? But then I guess I'm just a little old fashioned. So your presentation going over some of the old masters and the basics of design I found very, very meaningful. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Mm, Strong compositions, beautiful colors. I like where you're going. And uh, I really look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Anybody else out there? Uh, Matthew, unmute yourself, please. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Matthew. 
I found that really interesting. I really did. Um, oh, good. Mm. And that certain things I, I I didn't know about other things that it reminded me. Um, I have seen your original website with your early work. Mm -hmm. I also saw, saw your, I think, more, more, more recent one. It's interesting how you've changed. Um, I like the simplicity of your current work. Mm. And colours really pop. So I find that's really nice. Have you considered uh, writing a book about your art? Uh, <laughs> That'll be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, I think that might be a bit beyond me, but um, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I'll yeah. think about it. I'll think about it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I should certainly look out the Hockney books that you've referred to. Yeah, yeah. Um, very, very interesting indeed. Mm. Thank you. Much appreciated. Pleasure. Thank you, Matthew. And who else is out there? One of the things um, you guys may... Sorry, there's children here. Uh, one of the things that uh, you guys may not know about Marcus is just about how prolific he is as an artist. Uh, I have a barn outside with, with, with dozens and dozens of these paintings. Of his. <laughs> He's so, so unbelievably prolific. They're all fabulous. And they're all kind of, uh, under, well, very, very underappreciated, I think. Uh, although people generally love them. Um, for some bizarre reason, he's not selling them, um, uh, yeah. I, which I can't quite understand. But um, yeah, oh, thanks. I have I've got lots of them on the wall, and they're fabulous. I really, we all really like them. They I get are. lots of compliments. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want some bunts, though, don't you? Like a proper artist. Absolutely. Yeah. Compliments are cheap. Where's your money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because interestingly, I mean, the old masters, they use those techniques, not because they couldn't draw, it's because it saved time. They had such full order books. You know, I mean, they were in such demand, the greats. And um, I mean, not only that, they also had students or apprentices painting half the painting for them and they come and just do a few touches, you know. They're so busy. <laughs> it was a business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anybody else out there want to say anything? Miranda, please unmute yourself. Hi, Miranda. Thanks, Marcus. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize you started them from little sketches. You said you showed us your squaring up from was was that quite a small little drawing? Um, yeah, that was one. Uh, I mean, I took a photo of the setup, and then um, at the time I was very influenced by the work of Juan Gris, who was yeah. one of the uh, early. Um, well, people call him a cubist, but um, interestingly, he was. Um, the one artist that Picasso said, I wish he didn't exist. <laughs> he, felt, he felt threatened by him. He felt threatened by Juan. Yeah, yeah. yeah he did. Um, yeah. And I like the way he used to kind of, I mean, he was a remarkable draftsman, um, but he would abstract as he drew. So I, the one I showed that slide, um, yeah, once I'd taken the sketches from the shapes, outlines from the photograph, I then started working on a smaller scale to um, to kind of try and abstract it more. And then when I was satisfied with it, that's when I squared it up and took it onto the canvas. Yeah. But it seems to me there's an enormous amount. I mean, you say, oh, well, I just abstracted them and I, and I um, wanted to find balance and harmony and this kind of thing in the final work. But the process between sort of abstracting them in that way, I don't know what you, you call abstracting, and then achieving the final work, it, you know, because it could, it could go hundreds of different ways, and yet it doesn't, it goes your way. And <laughs> I'm wondering how you choose, you must, do you decide on the color scheme beforehand or something, or, or, and then some of them, 
I think, well, how do, why do you abstract them in that way? Because the, the little bottles at the end have sort of little personalities and um, presumably you bring that out. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, this is the bit I like best, actually, when, when you're just working it, reworking it, reworking it until it works, you know, it's... Um, I find that's intriguing that you say, well, it works. I mean, what yeah. works? Because it could be, you could, you, do you choose the colours? You say, well, right now I'm going to do a maroon and green number or, yeah. you know. <laughs> a bit like that, but then you stand back and you look at it and you think, no, that didn't work. And then you have to go back and do it again. Yeah. I forgot to mention, I use a lot of masking tape. Um, it just works so well, you know, with, particularly with acrylic paints. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, it's just a process, you know. And this is why I used to get so cross at college when, you know, my painter chums would say, nah, you're just a graphic designer, you know, we're painters. <laughs> so, I do exactly what you do, you know, I spend hours. Yeah, yeah I mean, you obviously art. go through a huge process. Of... Art, yeah, until it works, you know, it's just... Mm. That's the key, a kind of key phrase in a way, until it works. And I don't know why, one just intuitively knows it does, you know, it suddenly works. <laughs> That's all I can say about it, really. <laughs> well, you're lucky if you feel that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Halima Polk, please unmute yourself. We enjoyed your presentation. and. I, what I found so fascinating was, well, I didn't know anything about these techniques that uh, the old masters used. So I found myself intrigued by that. Mm. And it's, it's also, you know, I'm just a kind of a amateur painter, but I, I sort of frees me up a little bit. Mm. You know, not cheating, but just being very clever. Yeah. Absolutely. To do some things like that, and I love I love your finished products. Thank you so much. No, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Thank you, Halima. And back to our gallery view. And Susanna, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you. <laughs> I'm on my phone, so it's a bit more difficult. Um, uh, yes, I just wanted to. I remember, Dad, that you when when this when you sort of started down this track with your painting, um, Uglo was a, was a figure that I remember mm -hmm. you talking about a lot and he uses a lot of squaring up, doesn't he? And, mm -hmm. um, and, and leaves some of the evidence of that in his work. I just thought, mm -hmm. I just wondered if you'd talk a little bit about his influence again. Um, yeah, well, um... Yeah, I mean, he is the master of doing realism. Um, you know, he would set his model up, he would use plumb lines. And I remember actually being in a bookshop, looking at a, a Uglo book of paintings and um, a woman standing nearby just said, you know, do, do you like Uglo? And I said, yeah, you know, amazing. And um, she said, I was a student under him. And she said, he was a horrible man. <laughs> <laughs> but he was so demanding and he used to use um, things like plumb lines and all sorts of techniques and measuring the distance you know between things but what I particularly liked he would do he was painting things like um, cakes and single flowers you know and they were just in such immaculate detail and in oils which is a tough old medium for me anyway um and um so yeah i was influenced but i could only get to a certain level of realism i think that painting like the peach for example using photography but um i said in my presentation i found it a tad too easy well it was easy to do that but i no way could i push it to the uglo levels you know he he was just the master of realism but it was a painterly realism it wasn't an illustrative realism if you see what I mean he just explored the 
subject, you know, whether, as I said, whether it was a cake or a daisy, he would just explore the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much there. Let's see who else is waving their hand. Rohanna, do you want to say something again? Go ahead. If there's no one else who hasn't spoken yet who wants to speak first, I, I just have a comment and a question for Marcus about this, this issue of sales. And I've, I've been watching in many of my own exhibitions and people occasionally come to my house or my studio and look at my art. And I'm always curious about what, why they buy something and why they don't and mm -hmm. why other some artists sell so well and some don't and it's not yeah. it's not the better artists who sell well often it's often the, the people whose art is more understandable mm. and, and sometimes I find that especially the more I simplify and abstract what I'm doing it's it's a more visual process that is that is um, uh, grounded in my, my training in design and color theory. And very few people have that background in our society. Many of them seem to look at a work of art and, and it's the emotional response that counts. Mm -hmm. I find that they like, they sell, paintings with flowers and seem to sell well. <laughs> and mm -hmm. th things that have some kind of emotional content, a mother and a child or, um, Mm. Whatever. And, you know, I've even done fairly well with donkeys. And <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what I'm what I'm really interested in, and I see you are as well, is the, the very bare bones of shape, color, design, composition. Mm. I find works such as yours so exciting and satisfying compared to a, a, a mm. oh. average done landscape or portrait or whatever. But until we have more people educated, I, we, we just, some of the better painters like yourself just may, may not sell well until mm -hmm. people understand what they're doing. Like maybe mm -hmm. after you've long gone. <laughs> yep. I'm just interested in your reflections on that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I mean, it's a mystery to me as well, you know. Um, I mean, I have sold a few. Um, and um, yeah, I never know why. I am aware the, the gallery I'm with, the, the lady who runs it recently said to me, could you do some smaller paintings? Because people like your work, but some of them are too big. And um, I haven't got around to doing that at the moment, but I'm thinking about it. I bought some smaller canvases, but... Um, um, so that may only apply to England, you know, but um, I remember a friend of mine said, you know, I mean, I don't know how true this is, when, when he visited the States, to, he, he had the feeling that people went out shopping for a painting at weekends to, because um, they had such large houses and so many walls to fill. You know, it was like, uh, I certainly don't mind if my painting is seen as furniture, <laughs> if people want to buy it. <laughs> but um, no, it's a, it's a mystery. I mean, it's a mystery to me what paintings sell, uh, why they sell, I have no idea, and why some don't, yeah. I think you put it very well, Ryan, and I think it's to do with the kind of visual literacy, and I think, especially in this country, that people don't think art is about, um, it doesn't, they don't, have a feeling for a visual um, poetry as a thing in itself. They look at a picture as, as you know, there's something they want to recognize. And that's, you know, that's my, mm -hmm. uh, you know, picture of people on the beach or it's something they, and they are a little cottage that they, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And that's the kind of thing people want. And, and art is a sort of abstract, um, poetry like music kind of thing doesn't most people I don't think I think the I think a few I think people who are interested in art are very few and you get a few and then yeah. mostly doesn't just washes over them I and mean, I've just had an exhibition in the town and 
I actually did a lot of pictures of my local town and it, the show was in the town. And I think this is possibly, I mean, it's not to say that I've sold a lot, but I have sold a couple and I think it's because it's, you know, people, some of them are things people yeah. can recognize and say. Yeah, sure, that's true. <laughs> that's a local scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's what people want. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Yes. Interestingly, those two paintings I, I showed earlier, the peach and the oranges one, when I was talking about my attempts at photorealism, they both sold. You know. They did. Uh, yeah, people say, oh, I recognise that. It's a peach. I recognise <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> but I was, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't be so... Um, uh, I can't think of the word, but um, maybe years ago... Um, meeting up just by chance with my old pottery teacher and um, from when I was doing pottery at night school years ago and he'd got a he was a very creative potter but he'd got a contract with heels I think it was making these particular lamp bases and I was saying oh well done and he's saying no he said it's like working in a factory it's no better than working in a factory. I churn these things out eight hours a day just to pay the mortgage. Yeah. And he was very unhappy. Yeah, so uh, I think I, I, deep, deep down, have a sort of fear of ending up like that. But, um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I'd, be, I'd happily do a year of it. <laughs> I think that's prompting Adrian to jump in here. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, I thought it was a fascinating talk, Marcus. Thank you so much. Right, and, thank you. You know, I'd seen a, a sort of documentary about that aspect of Hopney and all the shock and horror, but we had a student who used to just put slide, you know, when we had slide projectors, project the image onto right. the and draw yeah. around it. Anyway, that's another point. But I think this business of things selling and not selling is fascinating. And a very good friend of mine, I'd put one of my so it's a semi-abstract, I'd call them painters. And she said, oh, that's a fantastic painting. Mind you, you wouldn't want it on your living room wall, would you? <laughs> and I thought, that says it all, really. Yeah. I got very interested in uh, just selling digital art, going digital on everything, because I'm getting too old now to fanny about doing all that. Mm. Um, you can make six figures a month, she says. And then she says, here are some of my best sellers. And honest to God. Mm party things like this that say power to mothers and a little sign little black and white but that's what people want because they yeah. somebody said it earlier they want to fill up wall space mm. and I don't know what I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is the only things of mine that are so consistently have been my collages which are funny they're sort of a joke yeah 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 mm. you know. yeah no it is fascinating isn't it yeah yeah, I mean, I, I've forgotten. I could now bring back in. I mentioned that this group I work with called Little Van Gogh, who I, I thought it was a good deal. Um, you give them 11 paintings and they, they won 11 because they need, in case one gets sold, they need to replace it. And they go out to companies all over the country <clears throat> um, um, who've got large buildings, you know, with, with offices and reception rooms and boardrooms, and um, they put up an exhibition. I've had, since 2015, I've had 24 exhibitions. They've been hired out to 24 com companies, and I've sold one picture. <laughs> and, um, but it may be because they are large, they're 100 centimetres, which is, well, um, a metre, three, three and a half feet by um, just under three and a half feet. Yeah. Uh, maybe people don't want big stuff. In England, people don't want big stuff on their walls. Unless they've got mansions, then of course they'd be wanting to have it. They'd be looking for investments. Yeah. Do they yeah. pay you for, for um, using your stuff for the exhibition? Do they pay you for... Van Gogh, the Van Gogh group, do they uh, pay you? They don't, no. Um, the deal so is just, you sell a painting, you know, the money's yours as long as you replace it, but they they make their money out of um, hiring them out for a 
yeah. a couple of months. Yeah. And uh, it seemed a good deal at the time. I thought, great, you get in front of lots of CEOs yeah. and managing directors. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> So I, I'm going to go back to them sometime when I get organised and say, hey, I'll tell you what, you can have the lot for a fixed <laughs> price and um, see, see what they say. <laughs> um, did you want to say something, Latifa? Thank you, Marcus. That was lovely. I really enjoyed the talking and the presentation was great. Oh, and thank you. so familiar, all those comments about the old masters and the, the way... Oh. We, we learned in art school all those things that they did. Mm. Fascinating. And I don't, I've not heard, I've heard of David Hockney, but not read anything of his. So that looks oh, right. yeah, yeah. Well, he and doesn't find many that. books. He's, he's much more of a, a visual yes. artist. Yeah, but that, so that one is it's a bit, bit unique, that one. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It is unique. Yeah. Um, I looked at your website too. So, uh, lovely lovely paintings i really like the colors thank and you. the compositions are great perfect actually thank you thank you appreciate that <laughs> thank you latifa so one one what's more referring back to why pictures don't sell i belong to a local art group and we have an annual exhibition and over the years we sell fewer and fewer and fewer pictures. Yeah. And again, I don't know why. Um, I mean, the quality is still there. Sometimes the quality is even better. Mm. And people are just not buying for some reason. Yeah, yeah. I can't answer. I just don't know why. It, it's a mystery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. you Crack that one. And um, <laughs> we'll all start making money. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, oh, Rahana, do you want to say something again? Go ahead. I was just remembering with, with uh, humor, now that I'm, I'm 79, and I'm not sure how old you are, Marcus, but I, I've been doing art off and on, although I also had another career in there somewhere for almost 20 years. <laughs> but um, I'm often amused. I get emails every once in a while from people who bought something that I did 50 years ago. Ah, often okay. it's from the kids or the grandparents. And what they want to know is with it, if it's worth anything. Oh, <laughs> but they don't come right out and say, is this worth anything? They say, could you let us know if this is an original? And usually it isn't because I sold prints so much more easily because they were inexpensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for, for many of the people that have bought my art are people who don't have a lot of money and my prices have never been very high. Mm -hmm. But those people, the artists who do have high prices, often there are collectors, as you know, some people look at art as an investment. And oh, that's, yeah. a whole, that's a whole other group of people that, People that bought, bought my art mostly just bought it because, I hope, because they liked it or they felt sorry for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we liked it, Rohana. <laughs> we liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you did or you wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> so it, it is a very interesting subject, isn't it? <laughs> Adrian, do you want to say something? I see you sort of waving at me. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just how these wonderful presentations, they start conversations going and thought processes and what yeah. we're talking about. It just came to me about Andy Warhol. Toward mm. the end, he was just a businessman actually. And he had, you know, did those designs and he sold them to Japanese businessmen and he knew what he was doing. Sure. So, you know, I don't know what that borderline is, but he was hugely successful at it. And, you know, his assistants actually did this, the work. Mm. He just designed it. So I just think, no definite statement there, but it is a really interesting edge. You know, yeah. where does the artist finish and the businessman begin? And why is it so many people in creative, in the creative world have no business sense whatsoever? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, got that drive. That's right. Yeah. You know, Whereas, get... you know, Rubens, um, 
Or Rembrandt was actually a terrible businessman. He made a fortune and lost it all. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Uh, yeah. Um, but people like Rubens and, um, well, Michelangelo, Leonardo, they were really good businessmen. You know, they... Um, but did they not have patrons? What, yeah, what, but that was part of it. Getting the patron, if you see what I mean, was part of being a good businessman. You know, I mean, if I knew how to get a patron, <laughs> I'd love one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Well, yeah, we could, I mean, it just goes on, doesn't it? Yeah, the idea that Picasso was a businessman is a topic I've never heard explored, but I'm sure you yeah. could go somewhere with that. Um, Miranda, you want to say something? Go ahead. I just want to add to that, Marcus, that quote from Matthew. He used to know Cecil Collins, who's an English artist, and he used to say, and he, I remember him saying to me once that he'd met Cecil Collins and Cecil had said to him, oh, I'm really pleased because I found a rogue to sell my work. <laughs> so he just said, you've got to find somebody who feels they can make money out of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you need to find. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, I'm still looking. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you are as well. <laughs> <laughs> I am, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember, Marcus, when you did the presentation on <clears throat> your old Ridwan, that you characterized him as being a relentless hustler. Uh, and uh, he was a successful commercial artist, um, mm. but he certainly did respond to what people wanted. And uh, I think when mm. he stayed there at Loudwater, he was telling you that the galleries were saying that people wanted smaller prints or mm. paper, smaller paperworks that would probably That's sit on smaller yeah, yeah. walls. Okay, thank you. So listen, before we go, Marcus, is there any final parting thoughts you have? you'd like to leave us with this afternoon or this evening uh no i mean i just to say i thoroughly enjoyed preparing this and doing it and really enjoyed the questions you know and um the conversation and um and it's so great that i think most people here are probably artists in some way or another <laughs> it was great um that uh talk to artists yeah and then the, you know a lot of us have that same problem you know we we can produce the stuff but um selling it's a different story yeah so thank you all very much for coming that was great well it does spark a lot of thought thank you so much for sharing with us and taking the time to put together the presentation i certainly learned a lot and you've yeah. enriched us all this today um, so I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Um, have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank Marcus. Bye. Bye.